Hi guys, Hanty here. Um, as a lot of you know, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary of being a production service entertainment industry company. What started as Humble Beginnings back on 25th Street, which was SIR's rehearsal studios, and then we moved to New Jersey, we bought the building at 1806 Park and started our production rehearsals. We started with three bands. It was Winger, Lenny Kravitz, and Living Color. So as time has gone on, uh, one of those particular units has continued to be uh, extremely uh, prolific in their writing and their performing ethic. And uh, we have the opportunity to do an interview with what I consider to be one of the most prolific drummers of that generation and the generations that follow. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure and pride to introduce who I consider to be a very old friend who's going to talk to us about the history, the current, and the future of Living Color and his own personal career and endeavors. So, again, without further ado, please welcome William Calhoun. Hello, Will Calhoun. I'm Stephen Acker, and I'm here on behalf of the studio at SST, and what a great pleasure it is. Of course, this is by arrangement of the founder and president of the studio at SST and your friend, John Hanty. Yes. I've been working with Hanty and SST for about 14 years, and in the past three years, I've conducted numerous interviews for the SST Backline Report. This is to be the first interview for the third issue. I'm honored to interview one of the world's best drummers and one of SST's favorite clients. I thought we would start with the most significant period of your life and your career, which is right now, of course. You're juggling numerous projects at the moment that I'm sure your friends and fans and followers will find fascinating and educational. For instance, in two days from you are conducting a, a special and unique online workshop. Yes. Frequency Rhythmic Assimilation. Yes. This is a term I dare say very few people yeah. have ever even heard before. So what is rhythmic frequency assimilation? Well, I mean, it's about rhythm and sound, and it's about taking the history of music, which would be more indigenous music, and marrying it with electronics and things today that we know that we call jazz or funk or rock or blues. But this, um, what I'm trying to do is assimilate, mean, meaning bring together the rhythms of what we may call modern music, which is 150 years old or 200 years old versus maybe something that's even as old as 40,000 years old. So I'm taking a lot of patterns and uh, wedding beats, beats for healthy pregnancies, beats for weddings, beats for funerals, uh, beats for health, these patterns, these really old patterns, which I researched, and I'm putting these things together in what we may call now more modern music. So I'm assimilating the two things. So although I'm doing rock and I'm doing funk and I'm doing pop and doing hip hop music, I am also integrating some very special uh, uh, ceremonial and older patterns. So that's why I use the term assimilation and the frequency is what vibrates is what how our eardrums vibrate, a pattern that makes you feel good. The best example would be, Steve, everybody that I know in the world loves James Brown. I'm going to assume everyone loves James Brown's music. Academically, historically, the rhythm of James Brown's music is Nigerian festive music. The patterns that are in James's music were played thousands of years ago in Nigeria when somebody was happy when somebody got married, when someone well, that was sick became healthier, healthy again, this, those patterns, not necessarily the pitches and the exact sounds, but the patterns, the horn parts, they're repetitious. This, the drums, the horn parts, the guitar parts are stacked rhythms. Those rhythms, if you do a research on the patterns of those rhythms, are Nigerian festive rhythms, meaning when those sounds hit 
most human souls, you get a good vibration. I'm not taking anything away from James Brown, the genius, because I think he is one. Did he know that? Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But in my research, those patterns and rhythms were happy, festive, celebratory patterns. So it's ironic, if you want to call it that, or coincidence, if you want to call it that. Two words my grandparents would never use because they believe things are what they are. Uh, uh, it, James Brown, when you hear it, you see people, it's infectious. They can't sit down. They have to get up. They start dancing. They feel good. And it's not a physiological or scientific mistake or coincidence that that sound and that music and those patterns have that kind of impact on human beings. So it's a deep thing to say, but I spent 30 years doing this research and it's a fact. So the frequency of simulation, what I'm trying to bring to the table, which a lot of people already have. I think people like Michael Jackson have. I think people like John Coltrane have. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I think disco is, a, is an example, whether people like the music or not. Disco has soca and it has Haitian beats. And has and that was also a music form. People, uh, um, although there was just there was this there was this time period of disco sucks. But if you look at the spirituality of disco, it was a time in the world when a lot of different races of people and different genders of people and different hangout. Uh, 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 how can I put it? Hangout etiquette, <laughs> the things that you were doing, all got together in one space and did it. Celebrated those emotions to that style of music it, it, it's not a joke that that i know i went through a disco sucks period and all, but if you look if you take away the politics of disco and you look at how many people liked it the dancing the cultures the race the religions the drugs the rich the poor the hip-hop the, the 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 avant-garde the high society everybody was dancing to that music so there was something going on in that vibration that was bringing all of those folks together. Yes, the, the beautiful people and the cocaine and all the other things made, you know, those are were, those were kind of the appetizers, <laughs> you know, but the menu of that, of that music was, the menu of those meetings was that music, that's what I'm trying to say. So that, that's why I'm, I'm, I strongly believe, and if people don't have to agree with me, it's okay, but... I've just seen it on both sides. I've been to the continent many times. I actually just, I'm just returning from, from Sierra Leone. And I've, I've researched the music and I've been with a lot of uh, masters of balaphone and kora and djembe drums and voice and different things. And I've also grew up in what we call North America. And I've been around uh, people like Farrell Saunders and Wayne Shorter, people that I, I consider to be musical academic geniuses as well to understand both sides of that equation. So the frequency rhythmic assimilation really is taking both of those camps and putting them together. And I'm doing a class where I'm wanna try, where I'm, I'm explaining the marriage of those things that it's already there. It's not a discovery channel for me. I'm just presenting it in that way. You know, uh, um, that's like, that's what's happening with this, with the sound. And I think some people are aware, most aren't. It's not important that you are, but I just like to have the conversation because this music is a, music art in general is a very huge part of my life and my existence. And I really believe that the definition of art is something as artists, we should know and wear. Just like you know who your parents are, you know who your grandparents are, or if your father or mother from Ireland or Italy, or Puerto Rico or whatever, you grow up in a house knowing the language, the culture, the flag, the food, the seasoning, the, the accents, the slang, all of those things. When you leave your house and you go out, you're representing all of those things that are part of your uh, spiritual makeup. And with, with, with music and sound, for me, it's something that I really would like to go out when I'm playing with Living Color or I'm playing with Lauren Hill or whoever I'm playing with, I want to have the this, those sonic spiritual makeups. So, Steve, if you might say, "Hey, Will, here's a chart. This, this is this thing is a, a Afro-Cuban six, and you may give it to me. Now, that's what it might be on paper, but when everybody starts playing, I might hear something different. So, I'm going to add in what I'm hearing to what you're giving me to play, and if it works, then we keep moving forward. That's basically what the 
my class is going to be about is not being afraid to to uh, um, to get more into the, this feeling of music and less of what the paper on the paper and less of what um, the titles. I'm not saying it's not important to know scales and chords and titles and things. It's very important, but the most important thing about music for me is the feeling, and and that's the part that I build all of my information from. This brings to my mind the great Clyde Stubblefield, one of my favorite drummers and often called the world's most yes. uh, sample drummer. It um, is. Well then, how much of a role in James Brown's music, the way you describe it, do you think Clyde played? Um, a key role is the answer. Because Clyde is playing those Nigerian patterns, without a doubt. The hi-hat, the snare, and the kick drum patterns, if you break those up and put them on three or four different drums, you're going to hear these festive beats. You're going to hear these festive patterns. So um, Clive, Clive is, to me, the most modern-day example of frequency rhythmic assimilation because <clears throat> he really dropped the bomb on us, in my opinion, on, on the ancestral uh, patterns and the feeling of them and put it in music for people to enjoy and love today. A complete master. Yes, Zigaboo also, there's a lot of guys we can, Purdy, there's a lot of guys we can go down the list, but Clive, I would agree with you that uh, by far, I think, put a major, major emotional stamp on the map when it comes to rhythm and patterns. Uh, that's why he's the most sampled. That's why his beats are like food. Everybody wants to eat it. Uh, it's it, it, it sampled fast, slow. You can put something on top of it. You can add other samples to it. Clyde's beat still within all of those samples, whether it's Prince's music, Public Enemy's music, George Clinton's music, you still hear him and what he's doing, all wrapped in those other sounds, which to me makes, makes my master. Well, three other drummers come to mind who I, and through my research, uh, have not seen anyone ask you about or have not seen you discuss. Uh, they were, they were three great rock drummers who started out as jazz drummers. Ginger Baker, Mitch Mitchell, and Charlie Watts. They each brought their jazz influences and their jazz sensibility to rock music, and, and, and those drummers are regarded as among the greatest rock drummers ever. Well, yeah, and I have to add Mitch Mitchell to that list. Of course. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it, 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 you know what's what's the Hendrix tune? Um, Impression? No, no, no. He plays brushes on this song. Up from the sky, up from the sky, is a is a is a is a is a perfect. I mean, you can hear Mitch and you can hear Elvin and all of that kind of stuff in his playing. Anyway, um, to me, more than all of those guys, Charles, Charles, out of all of those guys, is actually a, I can say he's a personal friend of mine. So we talk about. Charlie Persip, Sid Catlett, Elvin, Max. I mean, sometimes when I go to the Stone Show, we, we have our 45-minute tea conversation about the jazz greats because I know he's such a fan of it, and we talk about the music and the recordings and the drums and so on. Why I like to talk about this assimilation piece is that's my point. It's very, very, it's a very, very important part of the swing and the feel that comes from jazz that brought, brought into rock, and I certainly can't leave out John Bonham. If you want to talk about the rock guys, but John's more of a modern version of it because he had a heavier sound, but his shuffles and his Tom feels and his, you know, he's, he's kind of in that time stretch thing, which, which influenced me heavily in playing, playing to playing, um, recording living colors music. You know, I was heavily influenced by John. Well, all of those guys, obviously, but you know, John's sound and his approach to time. So yeah, what do I think about it is just that it's a perfect marriage to me. Um, when you listen to a song like uh, uh, Sunshine of Your Love, or Up From The Skies, or, or um, it, it, you know, for Led Zeppelin, Take Your Pick, you know, Immigrant Song, any of these kind of things where you hear these kind of, these very Afro jazz flavors, you hear pieces that could sound like Afro blue or, 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 or um, uh, 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 footprints, Wayne Shorter's footprints, you hear these kind of patterns in three and in four, and then the combination of some of the melodies, which come 
have more of an Asian or Indian flavor on top of those beats make the music kind of even even a bit more more interesting and even having an opportunity to meet and talk to some of these drummers and when they were composing these drum parts I love talking to drummers about what what were you what what kind of part what were you thinking about when you played like Sunshine of Your Love for me is interesting because the snare is on one and I've always heard the song with the snare on two until Living Color had to had to cut the song for uh, a, on a Schwarzenegger movie. And the Toms play the, the, the alternative beats where in a normal situation, and maybe that's the wrong term to use, but in a pattern like this riff, you would put the snare on two and play the Toms around the one. But I thought it was very interesting. So I asked Jack Bruce about that. And, and, and he was leaning more towards the accent being on the one than on the two and four. I didn't get the. I talked to Ginger, but not not about um, not about that particular song. But Jack was just more approachable, and and I've seen his band. I've been. A, I'm a fan, fan of his music. So I asked Jack about that because Jack is, you know, he's a bass player and he loves drummers. And he played with Tony Williams, one of my favorite drummers. And I asked him about playing with Tony and playing with all of these drummers. But I did ask him about that pattern because I never thought about that pattern until I had to cut the song myself. And then I went, wait a minute, something else is going on here. And this pattern is very Congolese, mm. very Congolese. So um, this, is, this, is, this is the very interesting thing about the continent and jazz and rock and how those things kind of merge. And Living Color really gave me the perfect opportunity to bring, to bring out those marriages of, of uh, Charlie Persip and, and, and uh, John Bonham even some more modern rock drummers like a Terry Basio. So yeah, uh, um, the jazz piece is a very important piece. And those guys definitely, in my opinion, made the music more interesting and, and broadened the language by bringing that, those jazz influences to it, to it. You also count Elvin Jones as one of your yes. major influences. And you are launching yet another project called Celebrating Elvin Jones. That's my latest, that's my latest recording, yes. Well, I became a Melvin Jones, I suppose, when I was about 17 years old and a prep school student. And one of my classmates, a music friend, uh, said, lie back, put on the headphones and listen to this. And he put on a vinyl album, of course, and, and I, a few seconds into it, I ripped the phones off. I said, what is this? This is crazy. It was like a cacophony of sound that I did not understand. He said, trust me, listen. So I did. I listened, and it was the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost from John Coltrane's uh, Meditations album. By the end of this 16-minute opus, I had been transported to an alternate spiritual state, and I do believe I actually levitated. So, so tell us about the Alvin Jones Project. Well, the Elvin Jones project is something that I wanted to do probably for about 20 years. Um, I was just intimidated to do it, and I didn't know how. And Elvin Jones is my favorite drummer. He's the first drummer that I heard as a child that sounded like heavy metal to me before it was heavy metal. I just think, I think jazz drumming had a language that brilliant drummers created, like Max, like uh, 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 Sid Catlett, uh, um, Papa Joe Jones, Pretty Joe Jones, Buddy Rich. You can go down the line. There's a lot of great drummers that that made the music uh, say, what it, say what it says. Elvin, to me, played jazz, but I think he spoke a different language on the drum set. That's my opinion. I just think he came to the music not playing those phrases that a lot of other jazz guys were playing before. He was, his time his, his was being stretched. His approach to how the ride cymbal had a different time than the snare, than the, than the hi-hat, although it was in the time frame, if you listen to it, it's very elastic. He brought something very Congolese to the table. His drumming is very much his solo style from, from, from the Congo. So uh, it, it struck me as a youth listening to music because Max and Blake and these other guys had something I felt that was very tangible and kind of had it had a shape to it. And when I listened to Coltrane's music, the, the Elvin took a different shape. He still played jazz, but the shape was different. And Elvin influenced me to become an individual on my instrument. I wanted to very much have a different voice on my instrument, playing rock or playing any style of music. And Elvin is probably 95% of the reason why I, I thought about even 
being different than other drummers in terms of sound. So anyway, I love him. I've been going to see him for years. I, I, I can show, in my living room. I have a. It was a gift, but I have like a thirty foot sized photograph of of him. It's the first thing I I put in my home <laughs> when I moved in here. Uh, my my good friend who's a fireman. He's a retired fireman. He knew I loved Alvin, and he bought a huge picture. I don't know. It's it's like uh, four feet by six feet. It's like a drum riser photograph of Alvin, and I framed it and hung it up. So um, when I took on this project. I have so much of his music behind me and on the other side of the wall is all vinyl. And I didn't know what to do because I love the train stuff. I love the music he played with his brothers. I certainly, one of my favorite recordings of all time is Elvin on the Mountain, the record with Gene Perla and Jan Hammer, where he's playing electric music, but he's still playing it in an acoustic way. And then I love that album so much, I was just gonna cover that record and, and do all the songs. And I was getting a little bit confused about it. So I spent about three and a half to four months, A, talking to people who were in his band, um, like the late, great Sonny Fortune, took him to dinner three or four times. And, um, you know, he yelled at me about some things that I shouldn't do. And he laughed about some things that I should do. And then Antoine Rowling, the great tenor saxophone player, uh, is a good friend of mine. And Antoine played in Elvin's band for five or eight years. So he had a bunch of shows that he recorded from the stage. So I asked him, can I borrow these recordings? Because I wanted to hear Elvin uh, uh, in that context. And I saw Elvin as a youth at the Vanguard many times. And I always went every night. Whenever Elvin played, I went all seven shows. I, I saw every show. And, and I saw, I did that with him up until he passed, from the Vanguard to the Blue Note, to back to the Vanguard, back to the Blue Note. So I have my own memories. I have my own field recordings. Uh, memories, photographs with him. So I basically wanted to, uh, homogenize is the wrong term. I guess I wanted to funnel in as much as the Elvin Jones material that I had into one recording. So my, my role was to A, take something that's classic of his, which is EJ Blues. B, take something that I thought was great, that's not so well known, something from Polly Currents, a record that um, you know, mostly drummers talk about. <laughs> um, C, do a Coltrane song of some sort. So I did Cousin Mary. And then D, do a track off of my favorite, one of my favorite recordings, Elvin on the Mountain. And that's with Jan Hammer and Gene Perla. And the bonus of this recording and that song is I had the gumption to reach out to Jan Hammer and ask him, would he play on the track? And I was expecting a resounding no. I'm um, busy. And he immediately said yes. He plays his ass off on a song and he mixed and edited the song for me. Well, why would you expect him to give you a resounding no? I mean, you're, you're the best. There is. I talked to his manager and his manager basically said, you're on your own because he said, Jan's the kind of guy, like he said, he said no to five big projects, but he said yes to two German DJ kids from Berlin that asked for the play on the remix. <laughs> so he said, you know, I, I can't help you. He made, he, and he said, and I don't know why he did the German remix song, but he liked it. So he did it. So, um, um, and, and, and you know what else was great? Being a fan of Jan, I didn't want to bend his ear, but I did want to talk about the Mahavishnu band and yeah. all of the great records of his. I have all of his mm -hmm. solo recordings the stuff with Jeff Beck and so on. Like I wanted to ask him about it. And he's a great drummer too. And he's and he's playing drums. And he mixed and recorded a lot of records he didn't get credit for. Like I think uh, um, one of George Benson's or Tony Williams' The Joy of Flying record that George Benson's on. He did it, he recorded it at his farm and he mixed and 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 uh, produced that record as well. It's not on the record that he did. So I knew this before talking to him and I wanted to ask him about you know, production and drumming and so on. So I was a, I was a fan, but Steve, he nailed the track. I couldn't, I think I played it 20 times in a row when he sent it back to me. I, I couldn't believe it because I can say on this interview, that moment of, of being on a recording with Jan, playing drums and, and listening to Jan solo the way that he's soloing is so much a part of my education, music education. So many years and hours I spent in my mother's house in the basement playing to stuff that Jan played on. And it came, it was a full circle moment for me when he when he just sent me an email saying, check your box. 
And uh, I opened up that box, man, and I freaked out. And I couldn't, I, I, I was, I didn't even know what to say. I called him back and he's like, don't worry, yeah, it's, it was great, man. It was great, thanks, you know? And he was honest. He said, there's a certain part of this song I don't want to do because my head is not there. But if you don't mind, I'd like to take a, another kind of approach to it. And basically he didn't want to do the, the guitar, the keyboard drum duo that he did with Elvin. I think also out of respect for his relationship with Elvin. So we just played the tune, and then there's a drum solo, and then then we go to Jan's solo on the end, which is phenomenal. And actually, I do like that he edited it that way. It's shorter and more to the point. And um, that those all of those elements make that record special to me. And I did call up uh, uh, Keiko, Elvin's widow, and I invited her to the CD release. And I told her that I was doing the record. I just wanted her blessing. Um, and to say to her, uh, you know, I'm doing this recording. I don't want to offend. I want to get the publishing splits right and everything. And the reason why I did that is because when he passed, she was planning an Elvin Jones celebration tour, and she asked me to do to be in the drum chair, which was, you know, one, a wonderful request. So that's why I, when I made the recording, I called her and and let her know what I was doing. I sent her the song list. And then the night of the opening at the Blue Note, she just told me she can't, spiritually, she couldn't make it. She was too emotional. And I told her, no problem. If you, I'm there all week, let me know. I'll send the car. But, um, you know, she knows I love Elvin and I just wanted to do something. I didn't want to, that's why I call it celebrating Elvin Jones. I didn't want to copy him. I didn't want to do a tribute kind of a thing. I wanted to celebrate the music, his music and how it affected me in my life. Ah, so you occupied the Elvin Jones chair on this project. And, and this brings to my mind another interview I did last year with the great trumpet player, Sean Jones, who's also from my hometown. And he had occupied the Miles Davis chair in a tour with uh, the original Miles Davis band, which included Chick Corea and uh, Tony Williams in the drum chair. It was a similar situation, you know, Miles Davis, Sean Jones... Will Calhoun, Elvin Jones. Another of your many new ongoing projects is your AZA collection, Rhythm on Canvas. This is fascinating. How do you paint a picture of rhythm on canvas? Tell us about that. Sure, thank you for asking. The idea came from taking drum solos with Living Color on rock tours, and I was trying to bring another element to the, to the solos because, you know, sometimes drummers, many times we get teased about the drum solo or, oh my God, it's long or it's this. And I said, what can I do in this, in this time period that could bring another element to my solos? So I auditioned this idea of taking these light sticks, which at first the Big Fresh Company made, and turning all the lights off in the venue. And I would make an electronic loop and I would jump back on my kit and then I would do my solo, but you can only see the streaks of light and you can only hear the drumming. You didn't see me and you didn't see the drum set. And I was trying to do something really trippy um, in the venue as an audition to ex just an art experiment. One night, Doug Wimbish, the bass player of Living Color, went on the balcony and filmed it with his phone, his iPhone. So when we got back on the bus, he said, man, you need to, you need to check this out. This is really interesting. And I wasn't thinking about it because I never saw it. I was just trying to have fun. I heard the audience scream and I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm accomplishing something good. And when I watched it, I went, whoa. The interesting thing about it is as drummers, we're playing, we're doing our movements according to the sound we want to hear, mm -hmm. but it's never mapped out. You know, you go into the ride symbol because you want to hear the ride. But there is a distance between the hi-hat and the ride. There's an arc, there's right. an angle, and it's really quick. So all of a sudden now, maybe that one move does two streaks. So the idea of this art was to go into a recording studio and uh, a photography studio, set up the cameras and shoot it with very slow aperture. So you would take me and the, and the symbols out of the photograph. The room was completely black and you're only getting the streaks. So what I got a chance to see and taking drum solos and playing with brushes, a roadmap, a visual roadmap of my movements, you know, 
because you, as a gentleman, if you think about it, we never get to see that. We just play according to the sounds. But imagine being able to play a song or a solo and have somebody hand you, this is what, how your, your hands moved in the last five minutes. And you look at that and you're like, whoa. So then is this an actual physical product that can, people can buy on canvas? Yes, it is. Yes, 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 it is. You can, you can purchase it. Um, I, I call it Rhythm Art. And you can go to willcalhounart.com. And basically, it's a photograph of my work. And, and, and then it's framed. You know, it's, it's one moment in that solo. So I took a couple of solos, some with brushes, some with uh, electronic drums, some with acoustic drums. So I have variations and different moods and different angles. You put that together and I have, I think, 13 pieces uh, on my website for sale if you want to get them. And the, the gentleman who has the company is very particular about making certain that the respect level is there. So we have to sign, like... When, if you purchase one, they send me the piece, I sign it. I take a photograph of me signing it and I send it back and then they send it to you because they really want to keep it as, a, as an individual art piece basis. So yeah, that, this idea came out of, um, out of me just improvising uh, uh, with art. You know, I, 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 don't, I, I believe it's all connected. Steve's sound and emotion and, and, and the academics, the thinking part, and the visual part, and the lyrical part, I think it's really kind of really all the same thing. And as an artist, I'm just experimenting with electronics, acoustics, visual, dance, and all of these things to, to make, to, to enhance and move further down the line, creativity, the, the concept of creativity. That is beautiful, man. I've never heard of anything like this in my life. It's a concept unique in all the world, as far as I know. Now, let's turn to the uh, impact of the COVID shutdown on the world and on you and Living Color. The last time Living Color toured was uh, in February 2020, I believe. And that was uh, just a week, couple weeks before the shutdown. Correct. This, of course, through the entire music industry, the entire touring industry, recording industry, entertainment industry, and to complete this array for, what, a year, you know, or longer than a year. But now that things are beginning to open up again, uh, I believe that you are planning a new tour with Living Color. Is that correct? Yes. When is that going to happen? The, the tour is called Summerland, and there are three other bands on the bill. You can look it up the summerland.com website, we are going to be part of kind of an, I'm going to say 80s, 90-ish kind of package. Uh, and it's going to be fun to go out again. It's a soft ticket for us, which is great. We're not headlining. I think we're going to go do a 40-minute show. We're going to kind of play the hits and we'll start to introduce some new music. But it's the first time to get out and play with other musical colleagues in an environment that's safe, and in an environment where we can enjoy the music and we're not trying to force the issue anywhere. So it's outdoors mostly. When it's not outdoors, it's in controlled casino type rooms. And the tour really is about coming back out and, and being artists again and under, under new, uh, honestly, Stephen, under new kind of restraints. You know, we have to be careful still with the mask situation. We still have to be careful with the tour bus, not having guests. You can't do after shows. You can't do pre-shows. You can't do signings. You know, these things are all going to be different for us because the relationship of touring now, I think, has kind of changed forever. But it's a brilliant opportunity to get back out and play. So this is a first step in a couple of steps we will take into bringing Living Color back out with a new recording. So check out the tour. It's called Summerland. It starts July 2nd or 3rd, I believe. But you can... You can um, you can you can go online and find that. And I think for us, I would prefer to get back onto the Harley Davidson like this, you know, rather than just go right back out there and do a headlining tour. I think it's been a minute. Emotionally, we've lost people. Some of us have recovered from something. Some people are still sick. So emotionally, for a lot of artists in our community, we we, we have we we have we were hit pretty hard. The, as I would say, the, the you know thinning of the tribes. You know, we lost some really great masters, young and old. And I think we emotionally want to just take the first step, get back out here and play, celebrate, 
still things that we love in life and art, play music and see the fans. And then next time around, we'll, we'll, we'll do a, a sort of a more of a wider version of it. But it, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to say hello again and do the things that we love. Living Color is also scheduled to headline uh, the Rock and Rio Festival. Is that right? That's going to be 2022. Uh, they're a little. They're, thanks for asking. They're a little afraid to do it now because, as you can imagine, both the political climate and the COVID climate in Brazil is is quite challenging at the moment. So the safe thing to do is to do that in 2022, which we're thrilled because Steve I is going to be the musical guest, and. We played with Steve together on the Hendrix tribute tour. So we already spent a month doing Hendrix tunes with, um, it started with Doug and myself, with Steve Vi playing trio. And then we would end the show with Corey coming out and Vernie coming out and then Living Color and Steve Vi did some things together. So Zay Hakado is the guy who runs the festival. He's a musician, guitar player as well. He's a dear friend of mine. But Zay didn't know that we played together before. So he called me to say, Will, I have a great idea. How do you think uh, Living Color Would Mind playing with Steve I? And I said, well, it's great, man. We already did it. And he was like, great, great. So he was really excited about that. Uh, but yeah, Zay, Zay's a very good friend. And um, I love going to Brazil. What, what I, I can't say what drummer doesn't, but what person doesn't. I mean, you know, I have so many friends there. I studied a lot of music there, Maracatu, up in the north part of Recife. In Pernambuco area, I did a documentary film I never released, but on Maracatu there. And there's so many great musicians in the favelas. Uh, there's so many uh, um, samba schools, Monguero school. I don't want to piss anybody off because the samba schools are like soccer teams. You pick the wrong one, people get uh-huh. pissed off. But, you know, I'm going to say Monguero school only because Ivo Moraes is my friend and Ivo runs that school. But I have been to other schools and I have enjoyed it. So... I don't want to get any bad email after this interview runs, but I'm just going to say Monguero only because he's like my cousin. He's a really dear friend, and he's a tremendous musician. He's a great drummer, but he actually plays everything. So Evo's, Evo's, my, Evo's like my brother. You know, I love him. So uh, 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 I, I was a little bit impartial because he was on MTV when Living Color first hit, and he played our videos often. He was on MTV. He was a, he was a VJ, oh. and, and outside of being a tremendous musician. So Evo really pushed us down there. And, and, and I think his and other people's work with Living Color in Brazil really made us huge in Brazil still. So, um, I, I, you know, that's the other side of, of Evo that, that's really important to the band. But yes, we're going to go. It'll be 2022. 20, and I am also looking to do my art down there as well. Now that I have some more time, I'm talking to Zay about maybe um, um, having maybe a showing or something, interactive media piece where I can play a little solo electronic stuff live with the, with the images. I'm not sure yet. We're talking about possibly arranging something else. Very cool. So why don't we step back in time at this point and let's discuss Living Colors cover of Who Shot You by Notorious B.I.G. Yes. That was five years ago in 2016. Yeah. And that was for the purpose, um, I believe, of highlighting the problem of gun violence in America, which is today, if anything, even more serious than it was five years ago. In light of this, is this still an important mission to you? Is this still a message you want to continue to deliver? And is Who Shot You still pertinent? Well, thanks for bringing... Um, yes, it is. There's, there are too many guns in this country in my opinion. That's just my opinion. I don't think anyone's Second Amendment rights should be taken away. I just think it's out of control. I think the entire scenario is out of control because the gun culture problem goes in and around a lot of topics. There's the police violence. There's gang violence. There's guns at home with children shooting each other. There, You can go to Vegas and go on a strip and go to a pawn shop and there's a lot of weapons available. You can buy like you buy candy. And um, I have a couple of friends in law enforcement. And, and one of my first times in Vegas, I called up one of my friends who's a, who was a Langley, Virginia FBI training at the time. And I said, man, w- I'm in this shop. And he said, yeah, and all of those weapons probably have 10 crimes on them each, you know, and they're for sale, like you could buy a, a, a used guitar. So I think culturally in this country, it's a, it's a complete infiltration of weaponry that's just out of control. 
and why it's out of control is when you have the political scenes separating the way that it is, you're gonna people you have people that feel more afraid, more pissed off, more racist, more sexist, or what have you. And then the equalizer becomes the weapon instead of the conversation or, or having discourse. So uh, that's as yes, I still see it being a being a, a problem. And um, we didn't want the song in the video to be about white on black crimes. We didn't want the video to be about um, white cops shooting black people. Certainly that is a problem as well, but we wanted to talk about gun culture as a culture because there's a lot of things you can, you can look into with the gun scenario that go far beyond the obvious things that we see on the news every day. So do I still feel the same way about it? Yeah. And um, I, I think we're, we're kind of late in the game. There's already a lot of weapons that are already out. And I, I think this country's in a really dangerous place right now between the politics and between how people feel about each other and the separation and the, and, and the, and the, the pandemic. You put all of that together, it's, pretty, it's a pretty amazing cocktail that uh, it's going to explode. I don't mean that in any detrimental way. I just mean that in an emotional way, things are going to hit the shank at some point because we've been doing things wrong for a long time. So, so uh, uh, why we covered the song? We love Biggie. Biggie's from Brooklyn. Corey and Vernon are Brooklyn guys, and and actually started out with Corey using the rap to sound check his mic. That's kind of how, just to get to the song, that's how it started. And then he would sound check on the mic. I would start playing the beat, and then one thing led to another. We said we should cover this song, and this is a really, it's a really, it's a really great song. That song deals a little bit more with the the beef he had with Tupac, but we wanted to make the song uh, uh, a politically approach to an issue in our country that needs to be addressed without uh, taking everything away from everyone at the same time, but just having it where it's safer and it's legally sorted and not just a free for all. Obviously we must strike a balance between curbing gun violence on one hand and preserving Second Amendment rights on the other. Now, turning back to a lighter subject, let's talk about a band called Bad Brains, which I believe was uh, one of your major influences. Completely, completely. John Hanty was pretty closely involved with that band, I, I, I think. As a groundbreaking black rock band, a precursor to living color, really, it doesn't seem like they've uh, really been given their proper due in rock history. I would say completely not given their due. And I would say without the Bad Brains, there wouldn't be a Living Color or Fishbone or any of, any of these other bands, I think, that came out here. They completely were ahead of their time. Brilliant band. I'm still in touch with all of the guys today. Eye Against Eye is one of my favorite records of all time. But, you know, uh, Pay to Come, Band in D.C., all of these things are just classic hardcore. Now, real hardcore fans know that those guys are kind of the genesis of the movement, in my opinion, which led to more heavy metal and other things down the line. But there were uh, Rastafarians from Washington, D.C. that used to play fusion and go-go and funk and rock, and they became the Bad Brains. I mean, the whole story is quite remarkable. But yes, they've heavily influenced us. We've played together and we've done tours together. We've recorded together uh, with both bands and individually. And um, we have a lot of respect for Bad Brains, and Bad Brains certainly, uh, I'm going to say, you know, open the door for Living Color to come through and do what we do, by all means. It, 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 they're still a very important band, and if anybody out there watching this interview, if you want to have one recording of theirs that you should listen to, I would say it's Eye Against Eye, and that was produced by the great Ron St. Germain, and I'm saying great because he produced Stain for us, but on the Eye Against Eye record, just a for a quick story, the lead singer of the Bad Brains uh, got caught. I don't know if he had a, a, a joint on him or whatever. He was driving from D.C. up to New York and was pulled over and taken to a precinct. And, and Ron, being the way Ron is, military, they were doing the recording and they needed to cut the tracks anyway. So uh, uh, HR sings the verse of the song from a precinct jail telephone onto the tape. If, if you think that I'm making this up, just, 
just you talk about phoning it in and 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 the song is called sacred love listen to it he's singing that through the phone onto the tape machine onto the two inch tape so not only is the band remarkable and the recordings are remarkable that story is remarkable when ron mentioned it to me the first thing i did was i called the guys up and they were like yeah hr got caught and he got pulled over and ron um i'm sure they can elaborate more on the details but he's singing sacred love through a telephone uh, uh microphone onto the tape ron st germain is i think one of the best engineers in the world and 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 he's a he's a guy that can make that happen yeah. and he did make it happen so um it, it's remarkable because I thought all of these years that Ron was just doing a special effect on, that's how I found out about the story when he worked with us. I said, how did you get that voice effect on Sacred Love? He's like, that's not a voice effect, man. He's singing through the telephone. I'm like, in the studio? And then he said, you don't know the story? And then Ron went and told me the story. And I, that's how I found out about it. <laughs> well, the wonders of ancient technology. So um, back to the present, I believe, Living Color is also planning to record a new album. Yes. We're going to start rehearsals at Tanti's place, you know, uh, the end of June. And we're going to get ready for this tour. And I'm a fan of the, of the studio. I do everything out of there, as Hanty knows. I did record my Elvin record there, to be honest with you. Huh? It, was, it, was, it was recorded there. So all of the projects that I've done with Bernard Fowler or any of my side projects for African artists, uh, Umu Sangari, I bought some tracks there. Um, um, Hamid. Hamid uh, a, a, a Ganawa musician from Morocco I brought out there as well. So anything that I'm doing, I always go out there because I love the place. And my Gretsch video was shot there. My 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 unboxing Gretsch video was uh, was was shot in in, in Hanty Studio. So yeah. I, I everything for me comes yeah. out of there. It's great. So the idea is in June, Stephen will go in and we'll begin the process of rehearsals and writing. And I want to bring the guys back to. Hanties, because that's talk about going back. That's where it started for us early on in our career. In '87, we were renting vans from Hanty to do our tours. In '88, we rented the Winnebago from uh, from Hanty. We did all of our rehearsals there, along with Lenny Kravitz and a few other folks. We that was the spot because we didn't want to be in the city where everybody was rehearsing. So we came out to 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 Weehawken. Um, so we have a relationship with him for years. He's always been great. The staff has always been great. The back line and service has always been amazing. So I would like to get the guys to come back to Hanty's to see how it's changed and how beautiful it is and how amazing it is. And Hanty's still the same guy. He's a great person. And, and get back to work because a lot of our success came out of working in that room. You know, Rolling Stones tour rehearsals for the Steel Wheels was there. Rehearsals for... Uh, doing the Time's Up recording, we're there. Some of the tour rehearsals for the Vivid on our first tour, we're there. So we have a lot of success in history in that room. And I think for this next next project, the next recording, it would be great to get back in there and and work. And and it's a it's a a really gorgeous, conducive environment for creativity. It's set up for you to to work successfully. Great staff, great gear. And no one gets in the way. You don't feel like you don't feel distracted there. And Living Color needs to work without distractions, without a doubt. So um, we we are looking forward to going back in. So time time purposes, I'm not certain. I think we're going to start with June and see how the rehearsals work out. And then we'll call Hanty probably in the middle of late summer to look at a fall schedule um, uh, where we can go in and start the new record. And this brings to mind a story about the Rolling Stones at SSD. Uh, you may know the story. You worked with the Stones. That's correct. In May 2012, Hanty and I were working on a musical project together we called University Jams. Uh, writing, recording, planning the promotion, designing covers. I was in Nashville. He was in New Jersey. And we were talking almost every day. Then one day, he dropped out of sight. I, I couldn't reach him. He wasn't calling me. He wasn't returning my calls. But then one morning he did call me and he said, I can tell you now, I was sworn to secrecy on penalty of death. And I knew that if I told you about it, you'd hop on a plane or drive up to Jersey. But now I can tell you, the Rolling Stones have been in the studio all week 
working out ideas for their 50th anniversary tour or album or whatever. Yes. And this brings me to the point of this story. SST building is, is a big, large brick building uh, uh, tucked away in an industrial area uh, by the Hudson River, a block, couple blocks from the Lincoln Tunnel. It's nondescript, there's no sign. If you don't know where it is, you'll never find it. And this is why so many artists like uh, Beyonce and Alicia and other of their ilk would come to SST because it could come as they were. It was completely private. We called it the quiet secret, but uh, it's not such a quiet secret anymore. We've adjusted. We've dealt with the COVID-19 restrictions. We've dealt with the shutdown. We partnered up with uh, Four Wall to create a fabulous big room, video, wall, lighting, the whole work. You've been there, I think, since we've done that. You've seen it. Yes, yes, it's incredible. And we're still maintaining the privacy and security of our clients. We've survived the pandemic intact, and um, it's beautiful, and oh, what a wonderful world it is. Yes, it is, and we have to make it better. Yeah, we do, and, and there's no better way, in my opinion, to make the world a better place than with music and art, because it unites us, because it is a universally shared expression of our hopes and our dreams. Music and art, more than anything else, have the power to unite, to heal, and to share. I agree. It's the, it's the, last, it's the last language. It's the last international communicative language that will bring peace, in my opinion. Wow. Well, that's a powerful and optimistic uh, vision, if I have ever heard one. It reminds me of that old Coke commercial. And I'm not going to sing it, but you remember it. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. So at this time, we could go back in time and talk about your upbringing in the Bronx and all that, but that's been covered by many other interviews you've done and articles about you. So I'll conclude by just uh, saying what a thrill this has been. So let us be here now and enjoy the moment, and I've enjoyed these moments with you. Thank you, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for the time. Thanks for the great, honest questions. It's, 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 it's nice to do interviews where you feel like it's really an interview. And uh, you talked about some things that, that I haven't spoken about before too on some interviews. So thanks for bringing up the questions. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, of, of SST and, and, the, and, the, and the room. And it's, it's been a, a huge and successful part of my career. So when Hattie called me and said, you know, you were going to do this interview, I said, sure, you know, give him my number. And let's, let's, let's make it happen. Because he's been a really, really supportive friend of all my projects. Even some things I, I took over there that I didn't take off. He, he gave me the opportunity to, to go in there and use the room. So as art, as communicating with people, as a language, as a peace situation, I've always been able to, to go to that space to, to create some form of peace, whether I was able to use it or not. But I, you know, Hattie always gave me the opportunity. He always opens, leaves the door open. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting, to getting back in there. And if, and if we're there and you're around, pop by, man. Yeah, that's that's very kind. Well, Stephen, it's been great speaking with you. Thanks. And uh, anytime I'm anywhere, if I'm in the, if I'm in the area, or uh, you're up here and you want to get a drink or get some food, or have a chat, or go listen to some music, man. You have my contact, mm -hmm. so give me a call anytime. Thank you so much, Will. What an amazing pleasure this has been. I look forward to seeing you. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks okay. again. Take care. Okay.